Step 5. Differential form. So we have introduced Maxwell's first equation and second equation in the form of integrals. We always said that we are considering an integral over a closed surface. And we wanted to know how much electric field passes through this surface. And that was given by this following expression, Maxwell's first equation. It was just the sum of the, all the charges enclosed by the surface divided by epsilon naught. In the case of magnetic field, the magnetic field passing uh, through this closed surface or the flux through the surface of a magnetic field was zero. And because uh, the laws are formulated in the form of integrals, they are, called, they are known as integral form. There's another form for Maxwell's equations, which are called the differential form. And we're just going to show them right here. So it's given by this expression over here. So it's a dot product, and we're going to discuss it shortly. Uh, and for electric field, this dot product is equal to the uh, charge density, electric charge density divided by, by epsilon naught, whereas for magnetic fields, this dot product is equal to zero. And this is known as the differential form. So the integral form uh, gives you a global picture of what's going on. It considers a finite surface. It doesn't matter that it's small or big. It has a finite size. And it asks the question, what's the flux of my electric field or magnetic field going through this surface? The differential form gives you a, a different picture. It looks at a particular point. It doesn't look at a surface. It looks only at a point in your magnetic field or your electric field. And it tries to tell you, what does my magnetic field uh, have to satisfy? What does my electric field uh, have, have to satisfy? And these are the laws that must be satisfied for every electric field and every magnetic field. So let's, in, let's see how we can go from the integral form to the differential form. So first, we're going to discuss this differential operator over here. And that's known as del. And we have seen something similar in this module already, but let's look at a, a closer look uh, in the next uh, slide. So this differential operator del is defined as follows. It's a vector signified by this arrow above uh, uh, the nabla sign. And it's a sum of all the partial derivatives in a particular direction. So if you have, for example, a three-dimensional uh, three space, this del operator is given as the sum of partial d by dx in the direction of uh, x, d by dy in the direction of y, and d by dz in the direction of z. So it's a little bit unusual because so far we've been encountering vectors that had uh, um, some real values or complex values in here, whereas now we've got uh, differential operators instead of real values. But in many uh, other respects, it's just a vector. It, re it, can, uh, it satisfies all the vector properties. And in particular case, uh, in particular, we can take scalar products, dot products, and cross products with other vectors. So two things to keep in mind. It's a vector. So whenever uh, you see this sign, don't forget to put an arrow above it just to remind yourself that it really is a vector. It doesn't matter that it doesn't have uh, uh, some scalar values over here. It's a differential vector. So let's look at some examples. First, we're going to apply the del uh, operator to, the, to a, a scalar field. This is known as the gradient. So here we've got some function of variables x, y, and z. And such a function sometimes is called, or often is called, uh, a, a scalar field. So this is a scalar. Therefore, when we apply our vector differential operator, we're going to produce another vector. So like we said, we take the partial, uh, uh, partial derivative of f with respect to x. That gives us the x component of our vector. We take the partial derivative of f with respect to y, which gives us the y component, and same for the z component, and we add them all together. So this is known as the gradient because the magnitude of this vector gives us the rate of change um, uh, of the um, function f in this direction. So for example, if we have the following function, the following scalar field, we can, we can easily now compute the uh, gradient of this scalar field, and it's just given as the partial derivative of this whole function with respect to x, which is just 6x times y times z. That's the x component of our gradient, plus the y component, which is given by 3x squared z plus z cubed. 
So we are taking f and we are differentiating with respect to y. And the z component, again, we take f, we differentiate with respect to z to get 3x squared times y plus 3yz squared over there. Now, because we said that our uh, del operator is a vector operator, we can take dot products as well. So what happens if we take the dot product of two del operators? Let's write it out. We write it out as this. It's just the dot product. And if we expand the whole thing, because it's a dot product, we expect the entire uh, expression to be a scalar this time. So what we get is we get a sum of second order partial derivative with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to z. And this should be a familiar expression which we have seen uh, already. It's just the Laplacian, which we saw in previous lessons when we were discussing wave equations. And often it's just, uh, it is denoted as del squared or nabla squared. But now we're really getting to the main point of this step, and that's, um, that's dot product of the del operator with a different vector field. In particular, we can take the dot product of the del operator with the electric field E. So again, we can just write down the mathematical expression. We've got a vector for, for the del operator. We've got our electric field components in the x, y, and z directions. And what we get is the following scalar product. We get a partial uh, d of ex by dx plus d ey dy plus a d of ez with respect to z. And this expression comes up everywhere in the electromagnetic field theory and it's known as the divergence. Uh, why it's called the divergence? That's because what it quantifies is how much the field at a point converges or diverges. We saw, for example, that if we had a point charge as the source of our electric field, here we are considering this green dot to be a positive, uh, positive charge, so we saw that the electric field was moving away. So the electric field lines were diverging away from each other as you moved further and further away from the source of the field. So in this case, we say that the di divergence of such a field is positive. On the other hand, if we consider a negatively charged, um, um, neg negative charge, then the electric field lines are going towards uh, this um, charge. They're moving closer and closer together. They're converging. So we say that the divergence of the electric field in such a case is negative. It's less than zero. And uh, we call this case basically being the, if there's some source of electric field, then the divergence is positive. If there's some sink of the electric field, then the divergence is negative. So now, there's a very important uh, theorem in uh, vector calculus called the divergence theorem. And re it relates the flux of an electric field through a surface to the divergence of the field inside, um, inside the volume uh, enclosed by the surface. And it's given as follows. We have the surface integral over a closed surface of the electric field is equal to the divergence of the electric field inside the surface and when we take the integral over the closed volume. So we can just substitute from our uh, first, first Maxwell equation for the flux of the electric field going through the surface. We can just turn it into an integral over the uh, a volume integral over the charge uh, density enclosed in this surface. So here we've got, from the divergence theorem, we've got an integral over a volume. And from Maxwell's first equation, we also have an integral for volume. So in order for them to be equal, we must have the integrands uh, to be equal as well. And this gives us our um, differential form of Maxwell's first equation. So you can see that the divergence of an electric field must be equal to the charge density divided by epsilon, epsilon naught. And similarly, we can follow the same logic for the uh, magnetic field as well. And what we get is that the divergence of the magnetic field must always be zero. And this is how you go from uh, integral form of Maxwell's first two equations to their corresponding differential forms.